Hey guys, you've been asking for me to make more content. So let's do it. Every Wednesday, 8 p.m., we're gonna have a new episode for you where I'm gonna tackle the newest headlines, the craziest articles, maybe touch on some research and give you some updates on what I'm up to. To kick off this Wednesday show, I decided to watch a medical drama that just came out last night. You've been asking for it and you got it. New Amsterdam, let's go. Dr. Bloom, she's dead. No pulse, no BP, cyanotic rigor mortis. I need a deep fit ventilator, ALS, and resuscitation team, now. That's impossible, she's dead. Well, at least she didn't kill her twice. If she wasn't dead, you need to start doing chest compressions if you're getting a defibrillator. So, I I'm not sure what happened in that scene. Going somewhere? I have to tape segments with the morning show and Megan Kelly, then give the keynote address at the oncology conference in Vail. I'll take that for you. Thank you. I've done a couple of segments on Megan Kelly. <laughs> You're funny. I'll be back next week. we we'll lunch at the tavern. My treat. Unlike the previous medical director, I actually expect you to practice medicine at this hospital because, I don't know, it's your job? You're funny. You said that. I'll tell you what, I'll continue giving speeches all over the world because you can't afford the kind of publicity I give this hospital. I understand what they're trying to set up. Uh, one doctor actually wants to practice medicine, the other doctor is trying to be more media savvy. This is something I have to reevaluate sometimes. Like, how much time am I spending practicing medicine versus doing media and social media? I think it is important to do media as long as you're doing it the right way because you can deliver a very meaningful health message to millions of people uh, instead of the 30, 40 that you may see in your office. Plus, you can get notoriety and funding for your hospital, for a nonprofit. Um, for disease research. I, I think those are very useful uh, uses of social media and media in general that sometimes go overlooked. While I don't necessarily agree with how she presents herself, I kind of understand her message and where she's coming from. Will everyone in the cardiac surgical department please raise your hands? Don't be shy, just get them up there. Great. Great, thank you. You're all fired. Any department who places billing above care, no matter how much money you make this hospital, you will be terminated. Oh, I am serious. Whoa. I doubt that that's what happens, just because number one, people have contracts, and number two, you're gonna be hurting a lot of people who need cardiac care that won't be able to get it from your hospital because you just fired everybody, so. Can we do something about healthy food? What do you wanna do about it? Uh, have some. <laughs> That's so true. If you walk into any hospital cafeteria, it's all wings, burgers, fries, and it makes no sense because they just walked out of uh, their meetings with their doctors and maybe are even out of surgery and we're telling them you need to eat healthy food. And then when they walk into the hospital cafeteria, they're bombarded with fried stuff. It makes no sense. So just tell me what you need, what your patients need. And I don't care if it's not covered. I don't care if the board said no. Let's get into some trouble. Let's be doctors, again. It's incredibly dramatized. Unfortunately, a medical director <coughs> can't make all those decisions because as much as we wanna be self-righteous and help everyone and change the system, it takes work. It's a step-by-step -step process. It's not, let's have one meeting and I'll change everything because I'm Superman. I read your files. You have the lowest billing rates in the department. What's wrong, you don't like surgery? I love surgery. Then why did you perform half as many procedures as your colleagues? Because my patients didn't need them because there's other ways to help people than by cutting them open. It's a very important statement to make. One of the things I try and encourage my patients to do when speaking with their surgeons is to ask a question, do I actually need this procedure or surgery? Because a lot of times, uh, as the saying goes, if you're a hammer, everything's a nail. When you're a surgeon, you're meant to operate. And this isn't to down talk surgeons because what they do is amazing and incredibly necessary but there are times where there are unnecessary procedures being performed. The first procedure that comes to mind that's been statistically probably overperformed in our society is uh, cardiac catheterization where they put a stent in your heart. And I'm not talking about putting a stent in when someone's actively having a heart attack, that's obviously crucial. But I'm talking about in patients where there's not a clear benefit or at least not a clear benefit over doing just medical therapy, giving them medications, changing their lifestyle, that sort of thing. And cardiac catheterizations are a huge money maker for hospitals. So you see hospitals shift their focus on performing these procedures and not focus on prevention, on focusing on lifestyle factors. Stop, everyone back 
away from the patient. Masks on. Now. BSF protocol in effect. Does he have tuberculosis? Check. Nothing Ebola? Left here. What's going on here? We have a patient in the ED from Liberia presenting oh. with all the signs of malaria, last fever, TB, or... Ebola. Oh, no! The first thing we do is call the mayor's office and the CDC if we even suspect Ebola virus. Now, the patient is in an isolation chamber with negative pressure airflow. That chamber is equipped with every available medicine should the patient need to self-medicate. What about us? Ebola is an airborne, but if you develop symptoms, you will join him. Until then, you will help him. Everyone interacting with the patient is required to wear personal protective equipment at all times, no shortcuts ever. So this is interesting because Ebola is a disease caused by a virus. Um, it causes a high fever. It actually causes you to bleed internally, which leads to organ failure. It doesn't really present with any unique symptoms, abdominal pain, headaches, muscular pain, fevers, low blood pressure. So it's difficult to understand if someone has Ebola or something else, so you have to rule it out. The reason why they suspected in this gentleman is because when they opened his documentation, they saw where he came from. And in an area where you have high rates of Ebola, like in West Africa, you automatically want to assume that someone has Ebola so that it doesn't contaminate everybody else. We don't have evidence of it spreading through uh, air, but we have evidence, a lot of evidence, of it spreading through blood, mucus, semen, basically bodily fluids. And why Ebola is dangerous? It has a death rate of basically one in two and even higher in some circumstances. You know pens and pencils aren't allowed outside the classroom. The pen's attached to my journal. Okay, you'll have to give me the journal then. No. You'll get it back in the morning. It's mine. Gemma, give me the journal. Gemma, don't do this. Gemma, please. <laughs> but it's mine! So when you have a patient who has a psychiatric condition, it's important to not uh, be provocative in any situation because the situation can escalate a lot quicker than it would with someone who doesn't have that condition. In this case, perhaps some more conversation, maybe calling up the doctor uh, because she has such a great relationship with him, could have fostered better communication and had her give up the pen without causing that much of a scene and her actually hurting a healthcare provider. So. It was handled poorly, but obviously healthcare worker abuse is not welcome in any situation. Gemma? Just keep it. Like, what, what's the point? Return them to baseline and put them through the system. That's my job. Look, if you can't help Gemma as a doctor, and just help her as a human being. Am I allowed to do that? You are now. That's why I always say be human first. One of the most overlooked parts of being a doctor is helping someone human to human. Uh, a lot of times, because we have so many patients to take care of, we lose ourselves in the job and focus on checking boxes and making sure that uh, we write our notes carefully so that we don't get sued. But in reality, we have to not forget that we're taking care of another human being. Mrs. Martin. You could stay here, but in this case, the treatment is worse than the disease. And with so little time, maybe there's someplace else you'd rather be. Not every patient wants to spend their last few months or years in a hospital going in and out of treatments. So it's good that he's doing that, although this is very, very, very simplified because she should have an evaluation by an oncologist who's a professional in that specialty who can decide whether or not the patient would benefit or would not benefit from treatment. She should maybe even get a second opinion because as it's shown before, doctors make mistakes. Maybe this doctor is mistaken. So I agree with the idea of giving patient options, but I do not agree with the way he's going about it. Oh no. It looks like Ebola because he's bleeding out. Hemoptysis meaning that he's coughing up blood. Um, I'm not sure if that's more he's vomiting blood than coughing up blood, uh, but I wouldn't say he's crashing. Crashing means his heart stopping. So I would call this more of a rapid response. So this is very dangerous because protocol is now gonna say that she has to be kept in observation and isolation. 
because who knows if she contracted Ebola, and if she did, then she will bring it to other people in the United States, and it could start an epidemic. Lauren? I know what you're gonna say. That was, that was stupid. I violated protocol. <clears throat> Lauren. Your glove. Alain, that shot they gave you in Liberia, they might have thought it was Ebola, but it wasn't. It was the Lassa virus, which is just as deadly. Except, as Dr. Bloom can tell you, the Lassa virus can be treated with antiviral medication, which we gave you. You still probably should have, have him in isolation, uh, just because you don't want the rest of the staff to get it and need antiviral medication. You need to slow down. Yeah. <laughs> Get that a lot. You have cancer. Squamous cell carcinoma. How did she know that? But you knew that, didn't you? How can I help? I applaud this show for taking a stance on showing all of the difficult things that can happen within medicine, how we definitely need to switch things up, and it gets me excited that people are talking about this. The show obviously has a lot of dramatic twists and turns. All in all, I'm pleased with this show. I think it was fun to watch. I wanna see more episodes. I wanna know what you guys thought, so jump into the comment section. Tell me what you thought. Tell me if you want me to watch more of this show, uh, because I think I'm a new Amsterdam fan right now, and, and I like the acting. I think it's well acted and well written that's for sure this is the first video for my little uh, video series that's gonna happen every Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time I think I'm gonna call it Wednesday's checkup let me know if you like that title or if you want something different again jump in the comment section and as always stay happy and healthy